Thank you everyone for joining my TED Talk on the politics of meat consumption. Today, I will be sharing with you all how my personal experiences with food have helped me realize the necessity of changing my meat consumption habits. Like many of you, the way that I think about and interact with food has been heavily influenced by my grandparents. My Nanu and Nana were born in a tiny Italian village of roughly 1,300 people called Alba, located about an hour from Venice. As my Nanu was born in 1932 and my Nana in 1935, both of my grandparents' childhoods were directly shaped by the poverty-stricken conditions of World War II. During World War II, Italy's per capita GDP dropped by over 55% of its pre-war levels, with a similar decline occurring in the household consumption of food. Studies demonstrate that by the war's end in 1945, the average Italian's caloric intake had plummeted to just over 1,700 calories per day. For reference, the recommended daily caloric intake is generally believed to be between 2,000 and 2,500 calories, depending on one's biological factors. Italian livestock production fell by 55% during the 1940-1945 timeframe, with an estimated 50% decrease also occurring in grain production. Food insecurity was consequently an everyday reality for both of my grandparents throughout their childhoods, with most of their meals consisting of polenta, cheese, and radicchio. Meat was an especially rare commodity for both of my grandparents, as meat consumption through Italy in 1945 had fallen by almost half of its pre-war levels, and would remain low until the early 1950s. When I asked my Nanu how many times a week he would consume meat during his childhood, he always laughs at the question and responds that meat was saved for special occasions like Christmas and Easter. When my Nanu and Nana arrived in Canada in the 1960s and began to build a living for themselves, meat understandably became the key component of their diets. The polenta, cheese, and radicchio that often served as my grandparents' primary meal throughout their childhoods was now, now accompanied meat dishes like kunin, or rabbit, spezzatine, or meat stew, and my personal favorite, osobuco, or braised veal shank. When interviewing my nana for this project, she told me that she would serve meat and predominantly red meat at that, at least five times a week. It was almost like my grandparents were trying to make up for the hunger they faced in their childhoods by eating meat at virtually every meal. The idea of intentionally reducing their meat consumption seemed, also seemed like an absurd idea to them and has always been met with laughter. To this day, my Nanu and Nana fail to grasp the concepts of vegetarianism and veganism, claiming that they will inevitably make you ill. These meat-centric values and ideas were taught to my mom from a young age onwards, and proved to directly shape the way that she thought about food. Meat was a crucial feature in my family's household throughout my childhood that my siblings and I would consume at least once a day. During weekdays, meals usually consisted of a simple meat dish that could produce enough leftovers to last a couple of days, like a beef stew, a shepherd's pie, or a beef chili. However, on weekends, my dad would channel his inner Gordon Ramsay and cook delicacies like gourmet burgers, ribs, and my personal favorite, lamb chops. The Leclerc family's weekend barbecue became somewhat of a local legendary event, as friends and family would always be looking for an invite. While my family would sometimes bravely attempt the occasional meatless diet, these efforts typically lasted less than a week before crashing and burning at the, thought of, at the thought of a nice steak. All of this is to say that a meat-heavy diet had become part of my family's identity, and we didn't want to have it any other way. Now, I'm sure that at this point in my TED Talk, you're all sitting there somewhat confused, as I've done so far nothing but glorify my family's high meat consumption levels, even though my presentation is supposed to be about the necessity of eating less meat. And yes, while it is true that my family and I were perfectly content and oblivious to our unsustainable meat consumption habits, everything would change in late 2018. On Christmas morning of 2018, my dad suffered a minor heart attack and was rushed to the emergency room, where we discovered that he would require a quadruple bypass surgery to restore normal blood flow to his heart. Although a quadruple bypass surgery is a grueling procedure that takes months to recover from, it pales, in what, it pales to what would have happened in comparison if he suffered another heart attack. We're very lucky with how everything played out, to say the least. What my dad's health scare did do is open my family's eyes in many different ways, particularly in regard to our perception of food. More specifically, our biggest takeaway from the numerous post-operation doctor consultations was that it was necessary for my dad to reduce his level of meat consumption, particularly red meat. Doctors repeatedly emphasized that studies prove that a low meat diet reduces various health risks, such as coronary heart disease, cancer, and type 2 diabetes. The consumption of red meat and processed meat is especially problematic from a health perspective, as a 12-year study published by the American Health Association 
finds that men who consume a daily average of 172.5 grams of red meat were 30% more likely to die from heart failure compared to men who consumed a daily average of 37.5 grams. To give you a better idea of what this means, 170 grams is roughly equivalent to a six ounce beef tender, tenderloin steak or the amount of bacon left in this pack. These health findings were enough to encourage my family to collectively lower our meat consumption levels from five days a week down to four and eventually three. As we grew more comfortable with our new diets and no longer snarled our noses at the idea of replacing a New York strip loin steak with a tofu steak, we began to become aware of the environmental consequences of a high meat diet. And what we learned truly shocked us. The global demand for meat has resulted in livestock production being responsible for roughly 70% of all agricultural land use. The nature and global dominance of the industrial agricultural model and its emphasis on chemical inputs means that a significant production of animal livestock has had, high, has had grave environmental impacts. Low ball estimates believe that animal agriculture contributes at least 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions, with some studies actually pointing this number to be closer to 18%. As of 2010, animal production also accounted for roughly 23% of anthropogenic global warming. One of the driving forces behind livestock production's high GHG emissions is the inefficiency of the practice. To clarify, it takes between five and seven kilograms of grain to produce just one kilogram of beef. This staggering statistic means that the U.S. could feed roughly 800 million people with the grain that American farmers feed to their livestock. When my family became aware of this inextricable link between the rise of meat consumption and climate change, transitioning to a meatless diet became a no-brainer. Going vegetarian seemed like the only logical course of action from a health and environmental perspective. I have since encouraged all those willing to listen to make a similar dietary change. Now, this change does not need to be as sudden and as drastic as going full vegetarian or vegan. An effective transition everyone can make here today is to simply reduce their consumption of red meat, as beef currently accounts for 60% of can Canadian livestock, livestock's GHG emissions. As simple as a transition as this may seem, some studies argue that eating considerably less red meat could produce a similar reduction in GHG emissions as abandoning our cars. In short, climate change is the defining battle of our generation, and it is a battle that humanity is currently on pace to lose. Reducing global meat consumption is no longer a choice. It is a necessity. Thank you everyone for your time.